Hey friend, welcome to Calligraphy Biz Corner, where we spill the ink on our real life experiences as creative biz owners. We're your hosts, Elaine and Xiao Chen, full-time wedding calligraphers and business educators with over a decade of experience working with wedding, luxury, and corporate clients. And we've mentored hundreds of calligraphers just like you. And we're in your corner. Let's uncover the business that supports the life that you want and leave the overwhelm and imposter syndrome behind. Grab your coffee and notebook and let's dive in. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Calligraphy Biz Corner. We've got a guest interview for you today, and they aren't in the wedding business, or at least not anymore. Today, we are chatting with Courtney and Will, the owners of Crew & Co. They are a product-based business, and they just published their second book called Abundant Grace. We're super excited to share their perspective with you because these are things that we haven't done before. So we really hope that this episode highlights how many different paths that calligraphy and lettering can take you down. One of my biggest takeaways from this interview, we're recording our little intro after we've already chatted with them, but one of my biggest takeaways from the interview with them was just this idea of building a business that's built on authenticity and alignment with your values and then how that will help you create a quote unquote successful business in the long run. Yeah, that really resonated with me as well. I felt like they really just took one step at a time and just did what felt right in that moment for the next moment. One of the things that Will mentioned that I really loved was kind of in this entrepreneurship journey you don't always realize what you're building. For a while, it seems like nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then one day you're like, whoa, I've got a little something here. You know, I've got a business. And I just love that hearing that from them who are really successful now, you know. So I wanted to share a little bit about the background of this interview since we found it to be kind of interesting. Um, About a month ago, at the time of this recording, we received an email from someone at a book publishing company, Penguin Random House. And Elaine and I were immediately like, someone found our podcast email and it wasn't spam. I mean, we were honestly so surprised that anybody even knew about us because our podcast was like three weeks old at the time. But I think it just goes to show that just put put it out there, whatever you're building, whatever you're creating, because you never know what could happen. You know, who knows what the next email will be that comes into our inbox. And then also, fun fact, Elaine used to actually work at Penguin Random House, even though this is like a completely unrelated inquiry. So, yeah, it just did feel very kind of, you know, serendipitous and meant to be. Yeah, well, and that connection came in handy because as soon as we got the email, I was like texting my friends who still work. They're like, can you make sure that this is a real person that's emailing us and this isn't spam? Right. Yeah. Are we actually getting scammed right now? <laughs> but that email is how we got connected to Courtney and Will, and we can't wait to bring their story to you. Make sure that you listen to the end of this podcast because we're going to be talking about how you can enter a really cool giveaway from them. So let's dive in. Today, we have two very special guests. We have Courtney and Will joining us on Calligraphy Biz Corner. They are a husband and wife team, and they are owners of Crew & Co. They are based in Mississippi, and we are super excited to chat with them about their nine years in business from how they got their start in the calligraphy world, all the way to creating products that encourage families to make scripture a practical part of their daily lives. So welcome to Calligraphy Biz Corner, Will and Courtney. Thank you. We're so excited. We're excited. Super excited to be here. Um, To kick things off, would you guys mind giving our listeners just a little bit of an introduction to who you are? Yeah. So um, we live in Mississippi. We have three kids. We both work in our business full time. So that took several years to get to that point to where we were both doing it full time. Yeah. how, How many years have I been full time? Uh, three, three, three or four. 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 Yes. I haven't been fired yet. I still, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I started doing calligraphy about 10 years ago after our first son was born. Um, and just doing that on the side, trying to help supplement income for my corporate job because I wanted to be at home. I wanted to work from home. Uh, I wanted to do something creative. And so it just kind of slowly slowly grew from there to become to where like 10 years later now we're both doing this full time so 
Yes. It's kind of crazy when you look back at it. It really is wild to like to reminisce about the good old days when, you know, just early, late night calligraphy envelopes. Crew, our oldest was a baby, I guess kind of when he started. And so there were there were so many times where Courtney would be like fourteen envelopes into a wedding and he would just walk through and smear them up and we're like, Oh, oh no. Yeah, uh, was not, but, our house at that time like, was not practical for wet ink and calligraphy stuff everywhere. So. Yeah, but those memories are so much fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I feel like it's so funny when you do look back, like you said, because I'm also like, how do they have the stamina oh, to go to yes. work nine to five and then come home and work from five to Whenever. 10, 11, yeah. 12. The energy and factor. And get up and yeah. do it all again. Yeah, because now we go to bed at like 830. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, same. Well, I know that you just shared a little bit about getting your start with calligraphy, and that's kind of how you have, you know, morphed that into your business today. But I would love to hear a little bit more, and I'm sure our listeners would too, because they are calligraphers, of how you like actually found calligraphy. Yeah, so I'm sure like y'all or mo like most of your listeners, I like in elementary school, love doodling, love doing, you know, bubble letters. I think in our art class, we had calligraphy lessons, but not like modern calligraphy. It was, you know, like old English like with that the, slanted nib. Like the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like that. So I used to think I was so good at that. Um, and that was probably in like fourth or fifth grade. So I've always loved writing and drawing letters and, you know, writing things for my friends and stuff like that. So once I discovered like pointed pen calligraphy in the early 2010s. I wanted to learn how to do it myself. So um, I kind of just like looked at things online. I got the book Modern Calligraphy by Molly Thorpe. And so that really helped kind of guide me and show me how to do things. And, and then it was just a lot of trial and error. That was in the end of 2013, early 2014. And so through 2014, I just kind of like started doing things for friends, you know, signs. And I had an Etsy shop with advertising wedding calligraphy or addressing envelopes and then it was just kind of word of mouth and through Etsy that I really got into the wedding calligraphy world. I got connected with a wedding planner in Memphis which is where we're from so I got a lot of business from her so that was great doing place cards and all that kind of stuff and then you know just doing signs for people but like we said earlier um our son at the time was a baby and learning to walk and our house was very small and not conducive for a toddler with feet and things that did not need to be touched. From there, we tried to figure out ways that I could kind of still be doing calligraphy, but not so much, I don't know, like In a, ho on. a hostile environment. <laughs> <laughs> so I started trying to like learn to digitize calligraphy which that was a whole I mean I didn't know anything about illustrator or photoshop or any of that stuff yeah um, this was back back in the day man 2013 like it was it was just like everything is figure outable so yeah, yeah it took a while but it was a little more strenuous before the dawn of uh like procreate on the ipad yeah. you know like it took a little more ingenuity True. yeah 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 because you were probably like writing things on paper yes. right and then having scan to scan it, it. And the time, yes. and I'm like, how now what? So. Like, yeah, and that almost like that sounds kind of like when your grandma tells you about how you know they had a outhouse in the yard when they were kids, and you're like, that ain't real. No, I like it's hard for me to imagine a world without procreate for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I did get. Um, I took a like calligraphy, not calligraphy, a creative coaching call from somebody named Meredith Bullock. That was in 2014. It was through Skype or something. I don't know how I got connected with her, but she did some calligraphy and lettering and art. And so she really helped me figure out Illustrator and like learning what on earth a vector was, how to do that with calligraphy. And um, I remember her walking me through exactly how to like scan the image and then get it in Photoshop or Illustrator and take the background off. And so thinking about that now, it's like, man, we've, we have come a long way. Oh, sure. yeah. I mean, for yeah. sure. After I kind of learned how to do calligraphy, then we started teaching or I started teaching workshops once a month um, just in our area. And we would have like 10 to 20 normally women 
every month. And Will would come with me mm. as just like the I entertainer. The, I was the TA. Yeah. <laughs> I, yes, I exactly. Me. exactly. I'm an introvert. <laughs> He's an extrovert. So I was like having him there helped and he just told like bad dad joke. Except and they except moments. they were good. <laughs> <laughs> so Will's not a calligrapher, but I think he could teach that class on his own with as many there, times as he sat through. there was there was a time where i i had it down I could, yeah yeah i could walk through and be like hey adjust your angle a little bit that's, that's too steep you know so now <laughs> I love that. now i don't i don't know if i could now but for for a while there my downfall is i'm left-handed and it's just it's well, just you know calligraphy is difficult when you got to go across it yeah. i don't i haven't i haven't overcome that yet mm. I always wonder how people manage not to smear their ink Man. when they're left-handed. I don't. Yeah, I, I still have like trauma from elementary school when we had to write on the chalkboard. I'm like, I, I can't. I don't know how. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, if you're out there left-handed, we had a keep few, up the good work. I mean, uh, a few left-handed people and yeah, in, in those workshops, and I was like, um, trying, to, you know, like trying to teach them the opposite way. Right, right. Here's what you do: mm -hmm. grab the pen with your right hand. <laughs> So it sounds like, Courtney, you started kind of in the wedding space yeah. and you were selling like the envelopes, place cards and things like yeah. that signage, taught some workshops. And then in 2015, Will, you joined Courtney and that's when you guys actually launched Crew & Co., your mm -hmm. current company, right? Yes. And you specialize in children's, or at that time, at least you ch specialize in children's screen printed mm -hmm. t-shirts that feature Courtney's lettering. So can you talk a little bit about how you morphed from doing the wedding calligraphy into this like product world? Yeah, so it was more of time and like time constraints and space constraints yeah. with um, our then one year old. And then we had our second child in 2015. Mm -hmm. I was still working full time also. Right. And being a mom, I just didn't have the time to commit to the wedding industry like y'all know, it's just so, I mean, it's intense. It's time consuming. Yeah. We have a friend that I grew up with. She owns Ryan and Rose. They make passies and stuff like that. She was encouraging me to start putting my hand lettering on t-shirts. Yeah. And so we finally did that. We figured out how to, at that time we had somebody screen print for us, mm -hmm. but eventually Will started doing the screen printing for all those shirts. Once I learned how to digitize my lettering, then we got it to be screen printed and it just kind of grew from there yeah and re really like everything I, I guess our our business model uh really has always been driven of figuring out like how can we spend more time with our kids and you know like some people in in the business world it's like okay how do i like how do i you know grow profits or grow products and and like truthfully i think our drive has always been like one like how can we produce products that'll give us freedom to to be with our kids but also like our drive in those early years was we gotta we gotta get courtney out of the the corporate world and into a place like where like we really want to be as parents and so early on i think that was our that was our driver is is we want to be the best parents we can be and what that looks like for us is spending the the maximum amount of time with our kids. And uh, yeah, I mean, e even now, that's kind of like, that's our that's our focus. Like our kids get home at about uh, four o'clock every day. So I try, to, I try to be there to play basketball in the driveway with the boys. Cause like, I know, yeah, you know, I know that's what they want to do. And I, like we could, we could be up here at the office grinding away a little bit more, but our our intention really and truly has always been like what is best for our family. And so the drive from like moving out of the the wedding world was kind of like, hey, this is this is high stress, man. And so but then Courtney's friend was like, hey, y'all should think about t-shirts. And at first it, it it's kind of the entrepreneur world. It's like new ideas always seem so crazy. And you think that would never work. And then it works and it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, so like we moved into the t-shirt world and that was fun because I really got to be involved in the business because I became the the head printer. And so we, that was like when we officially started to, I guess that's when Courtney became my boss for real, for real. 
<laughs> I love this because we're this is jumping ahead a little bit, but we talk a lot about creating a business that supports our lives. Yeah. And I just love yeah. that you're talking about this theme about how you're keeping your family front and center. You're scaling the business accordingly in a way that allows you to be the parents you want to be, like you said. So I just absolutely love that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it's like being a husband and wife team? There's always a, a learning curve when you're figuring out how to work with somebody. But then like you leave work and you go your separate ways and you're like, all right, bet I'll see you tomorrow. And you kind of like wash away whatever, you know, tension there was at work and you reset and you, you're good to go. The interesting thing about working with your spouse is like when you're done with work or trying to push off work, like you're you're still with them. Uh, so like you know, like you're you're together, you're you're in it to win it. So I think it's been a fun learning curve to kind of like better understand each other. And and I don't know if all girls are like this, but Courtney especially, she, I feel like she can read my mind. So. She kind of knows what I'm thinking before I think it. So I think that helps a lot in our, our dynamic of working together. Um, but really, it's just kind of understanding how we how we thrive in different environments mm -hmm. and like kind of knowing when to push, knowing when to when to not. Yeah. Um, and kind of we're like, still figuring it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. After four, four years, four or five years of being full time, full -time. working together, it's yeah. still like learning when. Like, you know, if there's tension at home because of, I don't know, somebody didn't put their laundry away or whatever it might be, mm. like trying not to let that come into our workspace, especially yeah. now that we have other people working with us. I think it's good for it. I think it builds, it's just real it builds life, our you know? togetherness because like, it's kind of like with our, with our kids, we, we have a, a honesty policy where like, we're going to be, we're going to be as honest as possible and we don't. We try really hard not to like sugarcoat life from our kids. And I think we do the same thing for our employees where like if they know we're, if we're having a bad day, then they probably are aware. Um, but I, th I think it also kind of builds a, like a healthy community that it's, a, it's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to be a little off, but figuring out how to work through that and like the, the, the overall output is still net positive kind of overcoming those hurdles to essentially say like hey like this is not it's not all about me you know it's about us together as a team and in, in husband and wife role like you really gotta remind yourself of that quite frequently yeah and like like I said earlier Will is the extrovert and I'm the introvert but he knows like when I need to come in my office and I don't want anybody talking to me like, yeah to give me space just because of like work stress or I don't know, an order or whatever it might be. Like we know that's a good thing is that we know when to give each other space. Yeah. And I, I always tell people, like I I genuinely feel that Courtney makes me a lot better. I remember this vividly for some reason, but me and a friend were at the gym one time and he was like, Will, what are your goals in life? And this was like I don't know, 2018. And I said, man, I don't think I have any really. <laughs> and you know, it's just, I, I'm just kind of like a, a floater you know i'm just i'm just happy just being alive and and kicking it and hanging out with the birds outside and stuff working with courtney is like that she sees where like my skills are almost more than i do and so she's kind of pushed me this especially like with the like with the book that we have coming out for example like i, I would have never done that by myself but she's always kind of been my like my sidekick my coach like hey you're you're a good writer. You should write like here. Here's something we should push for. You should do this. You should do this. And so that's been, I think, really cool for me to see as the husband wife connection is just how much she's helped me like truly to grow and just be better. I mean, it sounds like you said Courtney reads your mind. It's a, it sounds like the opposite's true too. So you just read each other. Yeah. yeah, back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would love to hear. I mean, it sounds like when you when you started to transition from like the weddings and the workshops to more of the actual physical products that you were selling, it sounds like it was still very hands on of a process. Like it sounds like Courtney, you were doing all of the lettering while you were doing all of the screen printing. So. 
did it stay like that for a long time? Or what were the some of the steps that you took to like help maybe automate that or outsource that to really start to grow your product line? Yeah, we don't even have kids t-shirts anymore. After the shirts, it kind of started evolving into paper products. We made like scripture cards for kids. That's because that's something I wanted for our own kids. So that was like outsourcing, finding a printer was so stressful. If y'all have ever had to do that, especially for like the specific kind of like cards I was making, I wanted like a whole set of like 52 cards. And so that was difficult. But like once we got that, it made our life so much easier just like having them printed and sent to us. And then we ship them out. Eventually, we did take away shirts and just focus solely on paper products. And so, again, that cut down a lot on our production time as far as like creating the actual products. Um, There was still a lot of uh, time that went into designing them with the hand lettering. And by this time we had uh, Procreate. And so that has made a huge difference. That was around the time that Will started working for the business full time because I was the only one designing. So we kind of saw like, if I don't have more time to commit to the business, Mm -hmm. then we're going to kind of be stuck in this like cycle of, I don't ever have enough time. And then he's always away, like at work full time. And so finally we made the decision for him to quit his job where he was. So that would give us both more time to put into the business. So it, it almost like felt like we were making not like a bad decision, a but it was bit. scary. Because, <laughs> you it, know, you do have to just kind of like it, take a leap and just do it. It's a huge risk. And hope right. it works. So that was like December 2019. Oh. And then COVID happened and we were like, oh, oh like, no, this is not we good. We chose poorly, yeah. <laughs> like that was a couple months later. And we were, But 2020 ended up being like our biggest year of business to date. So yeah. it, was, it was a blessing that it happened the way it did. Um, and 2020 is when we hired our first employee. So it, it worked out. Thank goodness. I'm really curious how, I mean, it sounds like you really kind of just learn as you went, you know, you, every single step of the way, you know, you taught yourself the calligraphy, how to digitize, how to create products, everything. Um, what were some of the key, like steps that you took to learn how to build a product based business? Aline and I don't really have that experience ourselves. And we know that our listeners, some of them do want to have like home goods businesses and calligraphy product businesses. So tell us a little bit about like what helped you build up that part of your business and grow it. Uh, Like you said, I just kind of figured it out as I went and like researched everything to death. Like Google, Google, Google. I read a lot of reviews. I remember I was trying to get into like art licensing and there is nothing on the Internet. I I remember not ever being able to find anything because I couldn't figure out how it worked or how you got into that world. I think I found uh, an artist on Instagram and who was doing art licensing and kind of like went backwards from there because at at one point she shared who she worked with or who her art agents were. And then I kind of reached out to them and um, that was a whole other like world as far as with lettering and calligraphy that was opened up once I found like an art licensing agent who kind of sent things to me like they still send things to me they say like here's our design trends for next season this is these are the colors that people are looking for these are here's some quotes sometimes they would give me quotes and then if I have time which normally I don't right now but I can submit things and if the buyers like it, then they'll purchase it and then it'll be put in a store. So I've only done it once to where they have accepted it and that that art went into Kirkland's. So that was fun. Yeah, shout out Kirk. Yeah. So it, again, it's just like everything is figure outable. I remember I used to follow Kristen Lay, I think is her last name, L-E-Y. Her business is called Thimble Press. And at one point she was selling a PDF of like basically every supplier she's ever used for any kind of product. 
She makes a lot of like party goods, but she does do calligraphy and hand lettering too. And so I remember talking to Will about like, I really think this will be good. Like it'll be worth the investment of purchasing it. And so I did and was able to find who she uses overseas for like creating journals and paper products. And then we still use him today. So some things, you know, you have to pay for. Some things you can find out, like being an internet sleuth, <laughs> you know. We we talk a lot about that of just like kind of weighing the investment cost versus yeah. the time cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes you can spend the time to really dive into something and figure it out. And sometimes it's maybe a better business decision to make that, you know, monetary investment up front so that it can just help you get to the next step yeah. a little bit quicker yes. than it would have taken you on your own. Yeah. And even like the time it takes to fi find somebody to manufacture things, you could find somebody and then they're just a terrible manufacturer. And then you're just like out of money. You've wasted a bunch of time because they're not ideal to work with or whatever it might be. Looking back, I was glad that we ended up purchasing that like list from her of all those manufacturers. Yeah. The way our business has grown because either a, a thing like that, that somebody offered to sell or people that were just willing to help us, like getting into the product world, that was a huge part. Like our friend that said, make t-shirts. We got another friend named Joe that taught us how to make t-shirts. And so I think it's it's knowing what you're after and then finding people that do it really well and kind of like, it's okay to ask, you know, somebody and be like, hey, can you like, will you teach me this? Or like, will you show me more? Or I'm interested. Is there anything that you have to offer? But that like along the lines of like creating products, like the tangibility side of it, I, I would add that, that I think sometimes when you look at creating products, from the business standpoint, it's just like, oh, how do I, what can I make that somebody's going to buy? But like when you're in the business world, like you, you need to think about selling a feeling more than a product. Like what are you going to produce one that's, that's unique, but also that somebody sees or holds and like they, like they feel your, your energy and your passion through that product. Cause I know like there's been a couple of things we've come out with. It hadn't done very well. And, you know, it's like, uh, we, like, maybe we didn't put like all of our, like all of our energy. You just kind of like throw something together and, and put it out there and see what happens. But I think, I think that like really in the, especially like the 2024 post COVID world, like for like product based things and art based things, people are really looking for and kind of desiring things that like, allow them to feel uh like in a deeper way so i don't know i would i would just kind of throw that out there as pe for people who are thinking about what what to make or how to make it like do do something you love to do and do it well find people to help you and don't be afraid to to grit and grind in the early days mm. i love that um can you tell us about what products you're currently selling and like I love that idea of the products should elicit like a feeling. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. how you create products that make people feel? Yeah. So almost all or probably all of our products are very colorful. Yeah. Like abstract looking backgrounds. A couple of times I've made neutral colored things for the neutral lovers. That's not me, but I tried. I created it and it just didn't sell. And I think people just expect the colorful things from us. So when I did do neutral, even though I thought like that's what the people want, it just did not work out. So um, like I said before, we have a lot of scripture cards and paper products. We have several sets of encouragement cards for people who are like struggling with anxiety or going through like pregnancy loss or grief. We just want to be a source of encouragement for people and so, like products that you think of like when somebody is going through those things and you don't really know what to say maybe you'll think of like our business and that's just something that you can send them to encourage them so yeah well, i would say especially with our with our new book abundant grace shout out to the new book that that kind of it like culminates like all of 
the parts of our business kind of into one. So you've got like the color, the hand lettering, the like the encouraging writing. And it's just, I don't know. I feel like it's like a crew and co bomb explosion, but like a, a good kind where we have copies with us if for hey. our viewers on video yeah. so I can see exactly what they're Yay. talking about. It is All that so color. beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, it's an amazing. Thank you. And this is like, this was before I came on full time, but we started post like the Instagram posting and figuring out, you know, you got to figure out your feed and your flow and like, you know, how you want it to look and all that stuff. And so one of the early things we wanted to do was to like, to not always sell something, but just to offer a space to be like, just to share truth or spread joy. And so from that led to us writing our devotion, daily devotion posts. And so I think we do two or three, two or three a week. We I used to two and five. We used to do like five a week. It, it's a little less nowadays. But so so we're a Christian company. And so it's it's all just kind of like taking a step back from us trying to sell you a product, just to say like, hey, here's some encouraging words that we'd like to offer you from a, like a story that's real in our lives. And so the book really kind of culminates all of that to where it's, it's like practical stories where when you read it, like you, you feel it because you've been in a similar situation. Like it's not, it's not like a, like a, a textbook kind of read. Like it's very, it's a very like personal applicable kind of thing. And then yeah. there's, like action action points at the end that, that just tie that into practical living. And so it all goes back to like our feeling behind the business that we really want to sell is joy. Like we've, we've always felt that we've tried to express that through the colors, through the style of Courtney's writing. I almost said through Courtney's fonts, but that's a, that's a no, no. <laughs> I talked to him about that. This uh, through, but you know, like that, so that all, like all the things that we're putting out, like it's, it has that feeling of tremendous joy in just everyday living. And so it, it, it's just kind of cool to see that come out as a book. It's kind of like this culmination of like what we originally offered as just a place where you could read something and feel good. And now like it's in book form and it's, it's coming out to the world. I don't know, it's just, it's just wild that. Like I, we would have never expected to have a book or a successful mm -hmm. business, but you know, through through those years of hard work and just like truly, I, I think truly just trying to like bring into the world something that we care about. I, I think that is like really kind of a big part of what a successful business like can fall back on is, is like, is it something that you're like truly passionate to to show other people? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like your story is such a testament to leading with your values and keeping those at the forefront of everything that you're doing, making decision business decisions based on that. And then also just staying true to yourself the whole time. Like, I mean, like Courtney, you said, like you tried the neutral color, like it didn't work because that's just not who you are. Right. So staying true to yourself, your creative side. It also sounds like and correct me if I'm wrong, but were some of your product decisions. So like when, as you're creating and you're trying to decide what it is that you want to turn into a product, do you base that decision as well on like, you're looking for something specific in the market that just isn't there. So like, you know, your book, yeah. for example, Abundant Grace, like I feel like this probably fills some sort of a space in the market that you weren't seeing for yourselves and that you guys were looking for. And thought maybe this is also going to benefit somebody else. Like maybe other people are looking for a book like this to just help them walk through everyday life. Yeah. I think from the very beginning, it was like that. Like even with the shirts and our friend encouraging to start making shirts, nobody was using like hand lettering for their screen printed like kids shirts. It was all font based. And so I thought that like that's something different. Yeah. And then when we made like scripture cards for our two year old at the time, that was because I didn't like anything and I'm a font snob. So I didn't, I could not find anything that was quote unquote, like good enough. So I just made something I liked myself. Yeah. And so I think everything has kind of evolved from something that 
we wanted for ourselves that we couldn't find on the market or that we wanted for our kids or that we were hearing people say like, hey, could you make something like this? Or um, I want, I don't know, this specific product made, but they wanted it colorful or whatever it might be. I think it all stemmed from things that we wanted or needed for our own family that we couldn't find, you know, on Amazon or from any other business. I love that. It's like the saying, create what you want to see mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. And that's exactly what you guys have been doing. I really want to talk more about your books. I know that you, this is your second book that is oh, yeah. coming out. Your first, actually, by the time this podcast is published, your yep. book will already be out. Hey, uh, um, so your first book was When the World Wakes Up. Mm -hmm. And this is your second book, Abundant Grace. We have never gone through the process of publishing a book before. Although, fun fact, Blaine used to work for Penguin Random House. So she oh, really? has That's like, crazy. Can you tell us a little bit about what the process was like publishing two books? Yeah. So obviously, like, especially with the first book, we had no idea what we were in for. We had no idea how long it would take, which it's I think for both, it's been from start to finish about two years, just from like when you first start talking or pitching or whatever. So that was the biggest shocker is like, it takes so long. Yeah. And I am such a last minute person, mm. even with our own products. Like if I think of something last minute for like the specific season or holiday coming up, yeah. I, I got to make it right then. And like, like November 1st, we'll be coming up with our product. Yeah. <laughs> so this has been a good test in my patience is mm. this whole process of like, just slowing down, like planning there's lots of planning. We submitted our uh, book proposal through our agent. And so from there, we heard back from a couple different publishers who were potentially interested. And we got to talk to them and like hear what they had to say and how they thought our book could look and uh, the potential for it. So that was exciting, first of all. Yeah, that, that's like the really fun part of the process is like the early the early phase when everything feels new and like super fresh and exciting. So yeah. like you're pitching your manuscript, publishers are coming back and saying like, oh, this is how we this is how we envision it. And that's like the like, that's like the heart, the heart pounding part. So from there, then, we got to choose who we thought like we would work best with. Yeah. And so we chose for this book, Ink and Willow, which mm -hmm. is, well, Elaine, you could probably say it's like under Penguin. A subsidiary. Is that? It's yeah, like a, we would call it like an imprint. Okay. imprint. It's like Penguin Random House is the overarching yeah. company. And then there are divisions within yeah. that. And then there are imprints yeah. within okay. those divisions. Because it goes. We're like the gift book division. Yeah. Anyway, we really enjoyed speaking with them. And so mm -hmm. like we wanted to work with uh, Ink and Willow. And so from there, Will did the writing. So yeah. he does the writing and I do the art side. So the art usually comes later. After, yeah. So Will went through the strenuous process of editing and back and forth with uh, the editor there. And, yeah. and the, it, I mean, that's over like months. Months. And I like editors have, I feel like editors have one of the hardest jobs in the world. Because the thing about writers is they feel really good about their stuff. And then the editor's got to be like, Mm. Uh, so like it, it's always such a with with both books when the world wakes up being a kid's book which is a little different of a like an editing process because the kid's book just you know it rhymes and there's a lot less words but the the devotion book you know it's you're just it's a different it's a different style it's a different technique but both times like you're you're getting you're getting edits that you didn't expect and I, it's such a like it's such a good process because you realize it's hard to realize like your own weaknesses or where somebody else actually like has a better idea than you did and you're like oh it's so, like you kind of got like you kind of got to wrestle with that and like you gotta you gotta choose your battles like oh I really I really do like this one part that sounds weird but where you said to change this that's a really good point and so I. As the editing process, I think it, I would say it's it's uh, strenuous, but it's also really it's really fruitful because the end product that comes out, I mean, I'm talking about truly is so much better than like what you first 
submit. And so it's cool how, again, like people helping you, it really makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah, because you can't see your own blind spots. Oh right? yeah, you're like, oh, this is wonderful. And then after, and then you're like, oh, that actually, it's not great. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm curious when you are pitching your manuscript, mm-hmm. what exactly are you pitching? Are you pitching the idea, or do you have parts of the book already written at that point? Yeah. Uh, so the kid, the kid, the children's book was like the the full the full story, the full rhyming ensemble. I, I think with especially kids books if you it's hard to pitch those as just an idea because they are shorter it's it's easier to just be like hey here it is what you think the the devotion book how yeah we, so how we pre- we presented it as like i'm doing the art and the lettering and he's doing the writing like that's not normal so we um formatted something to where it was like a side by side of the art with the writing so i think we did like five to 10 sample pages of what that would look like and sent that to our agent. And then that's what he used to pitch just so people could get an idea of exactly what it was. Like we had a very specific vision in mind with using my art and that colorful stuff. Yeah. Um, so that helped a lot. With the writing. But yeah. I think typically it, you would just have, you know, a portion of the writing mm-hmm. typed out or whatever. But we did format it just so, you know, it helps to see visually what you're going for. Yes. And also, I think it, it, it probably has depends quite a bit on the agent because they're the one that like initially grabs the publisher's attention. And so for, for us, we've always submitted what our agent has requested us to submit. And so there's been several there's been several submissions that we've submitted to our agent. Uh, that have not been published, you know, that they're just out there in, in no man's land because you submit things and you're like, hey, hey, this is a great idea for our next book. And then our, our agent will reply and be like, hello, uh, you know, we talked about this with our, 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 within our office and it is not a good idea. You know, so yeah, like, it's said cool. that. He but, said like, <laughs> let's just wait. Yeah, like, <laughs> well, yes, but, it's but a it's a lot nicer it's, than what you made it seem. No, like, hey, shout out Agent Andrew because he's the best in the world, but it's cool how that like there's such a it's such a tiered process you know like from us we sub, we submit to our agent and then our, if our agent's like yeah we're gonna like we can run with this this is gonna be good then he goes to the publisher and the publisher's coming back and forth it's yeah it's it's really fun there, but there is I'm skipping ahead from that fast forward from because I know that y'all will relate to this and I need some like validation uh. Um, so when we got to the point of like designing the cover and all the fonts inside, like I felt like I was being a big nuisance to the publisher. Cause I was like, no, I don't like that. Font. No, please don't like, ju- I'm just particular. And I, and again, I know most authors aren't like that because that's just not their wheelhouse, but being somebody who's been involved with hand lettering and calligraphy for so long, it's just like, I am particular. Right. But at the end of the day, you're putting out your work yeah. and you want to feel really proud yeah. of it and good about the final product. So it's also like there's a there's a dance yeah. that goes on, right? Uh-huh. It's like dealing with the publishing company and what their suggestions are and taking their feedback because they are in the book yes. business. They <laughs> yeah. know what they're doing. But also honoring what, you know, you really are feeling and believing and how to, like, advocate for yeah. yourself during that and process. And, yeah. like, yeah. again, we're still, we are such newbies in, like, a publishing and book world. I didn't know how much say we had in that versus, yeah. like, when they're just going to be like, no, this is what we're doing kind of thing. So I was just like. But, but they, they've been. They've been both, great. Both publishing <laughs> companies have been incredible to work with. With That's, me I, being particular yeah. about, like. I, please don't use that script font. Like, can I just write it and send it to you instead? Yeah, kind yeah. of thing. I'm like, Whoa. well, I think the outcome ended up being really incredible. Yeah, so it tur- it tur- all that hard work paid yeah. off for sure. So, how does it feel like holding the book in your hand? You know, after it's all of surreal. that. It's surreal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's 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 really weird. Uh, that's how I would explain it. Because like we we talked about like the heart pounding part of the book process when like the early stage. And then fast forward to now, and it's been almost two years. And so, like, there's so much time that goes by. 
when you do get the book, you're like, wait, did we do this? The time from like when we submit, like finally push submit on ev- like all the art, all the writing to now has been so long for them to, you know, finish the design of the book and get it ordered and made and yeah. in hand. It takes so long that it is such a surreal feeling like, wait, like you, you don't forget about it, but it's like, oh, so much hard work went into this. All the, yeah, all it- that editing. It kind of makes you want to cry a little bit. (laughs) Just like me. I mean, it really is. It's kind of, it's like the, like the whole entrepreneur journey is for so long. It feels like the thing you're working so hard on is just going nowhere. And then all of a sudden that you like gain a little traction. You're like, Oh wait, like there's actually good things coming out of this. Can you tell us a little bit? I know your book comes out on April 2nd, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. April 2nd. And can you share with us like where it's available? Is it everywhere books are sold or? Yes. So um, as far as online, it's everywhere books sold. So Mm -hmm. whatever your favorite book retailer is, it's, I think it's there. So that's it. That's also exciting. Target, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Mm -hmm. You can buy it at crewandco.com. We're also doing a super fun giveaway for our listeners, which is also going to give them an opportunity to get your book and we're giving away three copies of abundant grace plus store credit to crew and co very yeah. generous of you guys thank you yeah um we will have an instagram post up at calligraphy biz corner with all of the details on how to enter so if you're listening to this episode the week it comes out which will be on april 16th make sure that you head over to our instagram and check that giveaway post for all those details We've covered so much good stuff today. Just to kind of wrap up, if our listeners want to connect with you, you know, check out your stuff, where can they find you? Mostly on Instagram at Crew & Co. So it's all one word, C-R-E-W-A-N-D-C-O or crewandco.com. We're on TikTok here and there. For now, unless it gets banned, man. (laughs) (laughs) True. (laughs) I'm nervous. Okay. And we're on Facebook. <laughs> same same handle. So. Yeah. All those. <laughs> so, yeah, check it out. It's going to be a great book, Abundant Grace. It's all about finding God's grace in the everyday living life. Yep. Mm. Into that giveaway. <laughs> it's going to be good. <laughs> Well, Courtney and Will, this was an amazing conversation. I know that our listeners are going to have so many good takeaways from this. So thank you so much for just being with us today, sharing your time, sharing all of your wisdom. And congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so for much. having us. It was so fun to talk about all of our calligraphy days and how that led us to where we are now. Yeah. So thanks for having us. Y'all keep up the good work out there. <laughs> We got a lot of good stuff recorded. Yeah, I was going to say, is there anything else that you guys want to chat about or share? Mm, Hey, we're about to open up a a coffee shop. So (laughs) if you got people. Wow. Like, what's the timeline for the coffee shop? Where can people find it when it does open? Uh, Hopefully in the summer. TBD. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're really hoping for sometime this summer. But we've had our crew and co headquarters for, what, three years Mm -hmm. now? And so we're converting like the front half of the building into retail and Java juice. And then the back, the back half will be like our works workspace. Yeah. So Uh, we're, we're like 30 minutes outside of Memphis mm -hmm. in Mississippi. A short drive, short drive from downtown. That's so incredible. We're going to have to come out there. Absolutely. (laughs) Hey, if y'all ever want to do a calligraphy workshop, we could do it. I'll make, I'll make the coffee. Thanks for listening to our show. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to follow us wherever you're listening and leave us a quick rating. And don't forget, you can find us on Instagram at Calligraphy Biz Corner and send us a DM to let us know how you're liking the show. Until next time, keep the ink flowing and the dreams growing. Bye.